Go ahead. Hello, I'm Mark Kligman, director of the Lowell Milken Center for Music of American Jewish Experience. And we thank you for being with us for part three of our series, How Do You Say Bravo in Yiddish, Italian Opera for the Yiddish Speaking Masses, Early 20th Century America, as presented by Dr. Daniela Smolivi. This third part of our five part series is called The Russian Bear, Mikhail Medvedev. <laughs> we'll hear the right pronunciation shortly. Geographic, linguistic, and theater crossover. The Lowell Milken Center for Music of American Jewish Experience. Uh, we sponsor many different programs, and our season is upcoming with many wonderful events coming up. And we'll drop a link into the chat where you can see the listing of our events that are coming. Um, most of them are virtual, and we hope that uh, you can join us. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for the series, Dr. Daniela, Daniela Smolab Levy, who is a musicologist and specializes in the democratization of opera in America, including those aimed at Yiddish speakers in the early 1900s. Dr. Levy is a graduate with her doctorate at Stanford University, and she also is now serving as a postdoctoral fellow for the Dybbuk Project which is based in Israel. We're so glad to have Dr. Smolov Levy with us to present the series. And with no further ado, Dr. Daniel Smolov Levy. Thanks so much, Mark. I'm really glad to be here and to have a chance to present so many different aspects of opera aimed at Yiddish speakers. So I will uh, start by sharing my screen here. And. Okay, you can, oh, I'm gonna do the slideshow. All right, can you see my screen here, my PowerPoint screen? Great, thank you. So as Mark introduced, this is part three of this five-part series, and I've entitled The Russian Bear, Mikhail, Mikhail Medvedev's Geographic, Linguistic, and a Theater Crossover. So in the first two lectures, I focused on impresarios who aimed their popular price opera enterprises at the Yiddish speaking public. We looked at Ivan Abramson in the first lecture and Oscar Hammerstein, the first, in the second lecture. Uh, and we looked at how Italian opera mostly, but European opera in foreign languages, mostly uh, Italian and French, was um, targeting um, Yiddish speakers within the context of the Yiddish theater in the sense that it was aimed at the Yiddish theater public and some of the productions, Abramson's, Abramson's, for example, were in theaters that also housed regular Yiddish theater productions. But the opera was still a distinct cultural sphere from the rest of the offerings, even though some of the theaters were shared. And Hammerstein, of course, brought his, uh, brought his audiences to his opera house. So today I wanted to look at another aspect of opera in Yiddish speakers by focusing on the Russian opera singer, Russian Jewish opera singer, Mikhail, Mikhail Medvedev, and looking at how he's representative of the ways in which opera was within the Yiddish theater in the sense how it was embedded within the Yiddish theater context, not kind of alongside it, but actually woven through the whole theatrical uh, Yiddish speaking circles. So the plan today, I wanna to start by giving you an overview of Medvedev's career, just so you have a sense of who he is and why uh, he's um, interesting and important and representative of, of these, uh, of this embeddedness of opera in the Yiddish theater. In particular, we'll focus on his American tour from 1898 to 1900, and looking at three main points of overlap between opera and the Yiddish theater, at shared performers, at common performance style and training, and also at the influence of opera in the musical and dramatic content of, content of the Yiddish theater productions. So Mikhail Yefimovich Medvedev, it can be thought of as a Russian bear in both a literal sense and a metaphorical sense. In the literal sense, his name actually means bear of bear. The shortened form of the name Mikhail is Misha, which in Russian just means little bear or teddy bear sometimes. Medvedev means of bear. So his name kind of means bear of bear, um, but he's also kind of a metaphorical Russian bear in the sense that Russia, the Russian bear is an image, has been an image, at least for a lot of the 19th century, 
of um, Russia as a whole, of Russian culture, of the Russian, um, the Russian cultural sphere. And so as a prominent Russian opera singer, uh, as a representative of the Russian operatic school, and also as, you know, as representative of um, some of the early, some of the premier performances of classic Russian operas, he's kind of a symbol of that Russian cultural sphere. So he's a Russian bear in that metaphorical sense as well. But his real name, however, was Mayor Chaimovich Bernstein. Uh, he's uh, Jewish, as you can see, um, and he took his name from the Ukrainian town of Medvedevka, which was one of the places where he had lived with his family. His father was a rabbi in Cantor, and they moved around a lot. So that was one of the towns he lived in, and so he chose Medvedev after Medvedevka. And like many Jews who wanted to advance uh, their careers outside of Jewish circles, Medvedev changed his name, or Bernstein, I should say, changed his name to, um, to allow for that kind of professional advancement. So as I mentioned, you know, he was, came from a, the family of a rabbi in Kandra. He was born in 1858 uh, in the Kiev region. And he started out by singing with his father in synagogues and briefly also worked as a cantor. Uh, an uncle helped him enter the Kiev Academy in 1876. And that in turn paved the way for his uh, entrance to the very prestigious Moscow Conservatory in 1878. And Mivedev there became Rubinstein's protege, that is Anton Rubinstein, the composer and the uh, head of the Moscow Conservatory. So he really took him under his wing and helped him advance. And uh, in that uh, part of that early advancement was getting uh, Medvedev to premiere the role of Lensky in Tchaikovsky's Eugene in 1879, where he was, he was only 21 years old. Actually, if I go back for a second, you can see that photo on the right, that's him uh, as Lensky in that um, premiere. And that really made his career take off. And after he finished the conservatory, in Moscow, he started a performing career and the list of places he performed is really kind of astonishing, especially at the time. I mean, traveling was much more difficult back then, but he really traveled all over, performed um, many, many operas in many, many places. Um, the prestigious point of his career, the high point you could say was when he became the singer, became a singer of the Imperial Theater in 1882 in St. Petersburg, which was sort of the most prestigious position an opera singer could hold in Russia. And he was admired by the royal family, the Russian royal family, and gained a lot of uh, fame that way. And in particular, his affiliation with the Imperial Theater as an, or an artist of the Imperial Theater, as, as, as they were called, was a real selling point. And you see it, we'll see it in ads for Medvedev's performances in the Yiddish Theater in the United States. So another big moment in his career was when he pre premiered the role of German in Tchaikovsky's Queen of Spades in Kiev and in Moscow. Uh, and in 1898, he took on an American tour where, which lasted for about two years, after which he returned to Russia. He focused on teaching. He, that was pretty much the end of his performance career. And then he moved to Saratov, which was the first, they had it open, the, he was part of the first conservatory in the provinces there. He taught there from 1912 and was remained um, teaching and being involved in music until he died in 1925. So today I'll focus on Medvedev's American visit from 1898 to 1900 to look at how his presence uh, in this American Yiddish theater scene representative of the ways that opera was really woven through the Yiddish theater scene. So he came to New York, if we believe Boris Tomaszewski's memoirs, which we'll talk about in a minute, it might be a little bit questionable, but he seems to have arrived at least, whether through Tomaszewski's connections or somebody else's, through the Yiddish theater. He came to New York in 1998 and began performing in Yiddish theater productions um, in the popular Yiddish theaters on the Lower East Side. Uh, by June, he, and I, from June to October, he was also giving concerts of opera arias and folk songs in uh, not only New York, but also Boston and New Haven. He performed then uh, opera, more standard European opera in these Lower East Side theaters. He went to Brooklyn, then he performed in Philadelphia and New York again, went to Montreal, gave some concerts there, where, which actually were reviewed in the mainstream press, came back for some opera in New York. Um, and then an interesting sort of a, a, a prominent portion of his American stay was in, from August to October of 1899, when he did a lot of Yiddish theater productions at the Windsor Theater, where the very famous uh, playwright of the Yiddish theater, Moshe Horvitz, took him on as resident music director and composer even, and really promoted him as his star in many operettas, including new ones that Horvitz wrote especially for him. 
And then he went to Philadelphia and he did some opera as the director of the Medvedev Opera Company, where he didn't sing as often, was also music director. And there he seems maybe to have drawn um, more mainstream audiences. But the bulk of his career, as we'll see, was really aimed at Yiddish speakers. Then, uh, as best as I can tell, in the spring, he went to Newark in Chicago, did some concerts in Baltimore, and then he returned to do some opera in New York, and then he went back to Russia. So that was it's an overview of his stay. So as I mentioned, some of um, Medvedev's early time uh, in, in New York is chronicled by the famous Yiddish theater actor um, and man theater manager, Boris Tomaszewski, uh, and he writes very colorfully, but some of his account actually contradicts what we see in the newspapers. And he was writing almost 40 years after the fact. So there might be some discrepancies in what he describes. Also, one thing that's very interesting is that, as you can see in the ad here, that both Medvedev and Tomaszewski were performing not only the same day, but the very same time on the same day in Tomaszewski's crowning role, or one of his most famous roles, um, Alexander in Latiner's historical opera, Alexander, Crown Prince of Jerusalem. So they were rivals, but in any case, um, it, it does seem to be the case that, uh, that Medvedev received a very warm welcome from the Russians especially, and we'll see that element in, uh, in, in some of the uh, reception and advertising. Is my video still on? No. Hmm, that's odd. Uh, I see it some, somehow disappeared. Shall I maybe stop my screen share for a moment? I would just switch to yeah. now you can see my video again. Okay, yes. not sure what happened, but we'll um, let me just restart the slideshow from where we were. We were here. Okay, and then I will share my screen once more. I apologize for this. Can you see my PowerPoint screen again now? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. So as I said, Medvedev is interesting um, as a representative of the opera in the Yiddish theater. He's also representative of crossover more generally in the musical theatrical spheres of the time, geographically as a performer who was you know, a European performing in America, linguistic crossover as a performer who sang in multiple languages and the theater crossover in the sense that he performed not only in sort of the more prestigious serious operatic circles, but also in more popular theatrical contexts like the Yiddish theater. So we'll start by looking at um, how Medvedev is representative of the crossover in performers between uh, opera and the Yiddish theater. So Medvedev was actually just one of a number of musicians who had um, operatic experience and performed in the Yiddish theater. Uh, we have Melanie Gutmann Rice, who when she first came was Melanie Gutmann, and you can see actually that she performed with Medvedev in Carmen there in 1899. She came from the Vienna Opera. Not sure whether Tomaszewski brought her as he claims from Vienna or whether it was Adler who brought her, but in any case, she came over <laughs> and did opera. Um, she actually performed in a production of, of Fra Diavolo, a, a, a French operetta that was very popular. And she, according to Bessie Tomaszewski's memoirs, who was perhaps a little bit more credible since she's writing close to the time and was much younger at the time of the writing of her memoirs, uh, she says that that uh, Melanie Gutmann performed in German while everyone else performed in Yiddish. And that kind of mixing of languages was not uncommon in um, even opera circles, even at the Met sometimes you saw that, and also in popular price performances of opera. Uh, Regina Prager was another major Yiddish theater superstar who came from operatic training and in fact had uh, aspirations to pursue an operatic career, but was apparently talked out of it by Goldfaden, and who saw tremendous potential in her. And so she got um, to lured into staying into the Yiddish theater, but you can hear, as you'll hear in a moment, her voice is very operatic. Bertha Kalish, also Virginia Prager's uh, rival as a, as a you know, uh, Yiddish theater uh, female lead star, prima donna. She also had operatic training, as did uh, the, the baritone Joseph Vinogradov, who had in many ways a quite similar career to Medvedev's as a Russian Jewish opera singer who later uh, crossed into Yiddish theater um, and also actually became a cantor. Uh, so Medvedev was just a, one of this growing group of artists, both from opera and the Yiddish theater, whom managers like 
Tomaszewski and Horowitz and Adler were bringing over from Europe to inject life and novelty into the Yiddish theater, which was extremely competitive. So everybody was looking for a way to make themselves stand out and opera singers were one way in which these managers were trying to, to lure audiences. Horvitz, in fact, a few years later, brought over an entire troupe of opera singers uh, from Romania, Galicia, to do Italian and French opera in Yiddish translation even. So uh, there was a lot of, a lot of uh, transatlantic um, exchange at the time. In fact, so many that the current um, artists of the Yiddish theater were motivated to form the Hebrew Actors Union as a way of protecting themselves against the newcomers. And as I mentioned earlier, Medvedev's imperial pedigree was extremely important. It's promoted in every, every ad that he's in. So the fact that he was an opera singer with this prestigious background was evidently something that the managers thought would be appealing to audiences. And one final thing to note is that, as you can see from the Carmen poster, the prices for these operatic performances as well as, of course, for the Yiddish theater productions were all at the regular theater prices. So by operatic standards, these were quote unquote popular prices. But the point is that these are all very affordable. This is not out of the norm for Yiddish theater audiences. So this would have been viewed as something perfectly accessible from a financial standpoint. So I want to play you a little bit from a recording of Regina Prager singing an excerpt from Goldfaden's uh, Shulamis, just to get a feel for um, this, the style of seeing at the time from somebody who had, uh, you know, an, as I said, an operatic background um, that she brought to her, uh, to her singing. So go here. something that's available in the public domain. So if you're curious to hear more of this or any other uh, recordings of this style, you can um, certainly access them yourself. Um, can everybody see my PowerPoint screen again? Yes, great, thank you. Okay, good. So Shulamis was in fact one of the operettas that the video sang when he came to America. Um, as you can see here, his repertoire while in the United States was quite a staggering array of things for a very short time. It really spanned the full range of opera and Yiddish theater productions. He did Goldfaden, he did the Schund, quote unquote, trash operettas, the historical operettas by people like Horvitz and Latiner that were extremely popular and kind of splashy entertainment vehicles for the special vehicle for star performers like Tomaszewski. Um, he did he even did a play by Gordon, which was among the more serious uh, Yiddish theater productions. He also did, as you can see, also the standard, but many of the standard French and Italian operas. Carmen, Faust, uh, and he also did operas that were uh, known to Yiddish speaking audiences in particular, things like Halaviz Jadovka or La Juive, um, as well as Samson and Delilah, presumably because of its you know, biblical theme that would have interested uh, Jewish audiences. He also was known for his, uh, in, in Russia, for his performance in uh, the Polish opera, Galka. So he also did that in the United States. And according to the memoirs of Boaz Young, one of the actors um, in the Yiddish theater who worked a lot for Horvitz actually. Uh, he says that if he recalls correctly in Galka, Medvedev sang in Polish while the rest of the 
um, troupe performed in Yiddish, so another example of this mixing of languages. One thing that's interesting about the performance of Jodovka is that the ads in the newspapers advertise it as in pure Yiddish, in proper Yiddish, which suggests maybe that people would have wondered whether he would or not. Tomaszewski claims that one of uh, the things that struck him about Mbeyo's performances was that he spoke Yiddish with an accent, um, which is, I suppose, plausible given that Mbeyo probably wouldn't have been speaking it much since his childhood, he probably would have been speaking predominantly Russian. But given the number of performances of Yiddish production, of the Yiddish theater performances that he did, uh, obviously didn't bother audiences that much because these, you know, these producers were um, competing tremendously for audiences, so they weren't going to keep somebody on if they weren't drawing at least, uh, you know, sufficient audiences. Another thing that Ibeyo did, as I mentioned earlier, was he did concerts of romances and arias from operas, especially Russian operas by composers like Borodin, Tchaikovsky, Grim Kondergomushsky. He also did folk songs, Russian folk songs, and what were known as Malorussian, Maloruski, uh, which were sort of Ukrainian. The regional divisions were a little bit blurry at the time, but anyway, he did folk songs that his audiences would have known as well. As he also sang in Yiddish. And apparently for these concerts in particular, the audiences were composed largely of Russians who came from quite distant places to hear him because he had been so famous in Russia and they knew of him. There's a funny review of a concert he gave in New Haven where, and it's something I haven't seen in practically any reviews and I've looked at a lot of <laughs> concert reviews and the reviewer notes that there were a lot of children at this concert. I mean, they were making a lot of noise and interrupting him at the you know, main points of his arias and really being disruptive, um, but the audience certainly didn't care and was just going nuts. So it strikes me as interesting that people would have brought their children to something like this, maybe because it was so famous. But in any case, he was really known as a, as a Russian uh, opera singer um, and clearly had, had, had brought a lot of fame with him. And you can see here an ad for his performances in um, uh, Pagliacci and one act of Rubinstein's Yemen. Uh, and you see the, the poster here is half in Russian and half in Yiddish, you know, suggestive of the target audiences here. And this here is a poster, or sorry, a theater program for Samson and Delilah, interestingly in English. And this is also uh, interesting um, in that it uh, shows the video's repertoire of the things that the operas that he sings or presumably was ready to sing in uh, the United States. And he seems to have done some of them, um, perhaps all of them, but it's hard to get a full listing. Of course, you have to rely on memoirs, on newspaper ads. But anyway, it's interesting to see the, the range here um, as representative of this, as we, as we talked about, you know, the Italian, the French, the Russian, and the Jewish themed as well. So I now want to move to looking at a second form of overlap between opera and the Yiddish theater sphere. And that is the similarity in performance style, um, the singing style, as you saw from that recording of Regina Prager, certainly not all of the musical uh, performance style of the Yiddish theater, but certainly of the grander um, sort of very important or set pieces of uh, many of the Yiddish theater productions, especially the historical operettas that drew on, as we'll see a little bit, drew on a lot of opera. And a lot of this overlap in performance style has to do with an overlap in training. As you can see, I put together this chart to try to show the different interactions between the different spheres of musical uh, theatrical production in either speaking circles uh, and in uh, Jewish circles and in opera. And a common feature of, of these spheres is a cantorial training. Uh, many people involved in the Yiddish theater, um, like Tomaszewski and the actor Kalma Nuvelier, who worked both in, in Europe and America with Horvitz uh, and with Goldfaden, also the librettist composer duo of Arnold, Arnold Perl Perlmutter and Hermann Voll, who wrote many, many operettas, the music for many operettas for Horvitz and, and other playwrights, massively prolific uh, when they came to the United States around 1900. They too trained as um, synagogue choristers, as Mishlerari, training with cantors before moving to the Yiddish theater. And Medvedev too, along with Vinagradov, as you mentioned earlier, got um, their beginnings, uh, their, their early training in singing in synagogues. And as many people have noted and written about, there is much in common in the uh, singing style of cantorial training, the kind of breath support, the projection, 
the training of the voice to do melismatic, sort of elaborate virtuosic um, turns and, and phrases, very similar to what opera singers are doing. And it's no surprise that many, there are many opera singers who are also cantors, which is its own uh, fascinating topic and that overlap between those spheres. But in any case, you can see here how the cantorial training influenced both uh, the opera and the Yiddish theater. Because Medvedev's performance career ended right around the time when perform when recording was coming into its own, we don't have any recordings of him, but the opera singer, cantor, Yiddish theater performer, Josephine Nagadov, as I mentioned, was only eight years younger than Medvedev. He, uh, he made a, quite a number of recordings. His career lasted much longer. He, um, he, and he became a cantor, as I mentioned. So he made a lot of recordings so we can listen to him as to get a little bit of a sense of what Medvedev sounded like. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, they both had uh, cantorial training and uh, they actually both studied with the same Italian opera singer Galvani when in Russia. Vinagrav also performed many of the same operas that Medvedev did. So we can, we'll have to take our best, uh, our best guess at what, um, at what uh, uh, sorry, Medvedev might have sounded like. So let me um, hear. It's him singing from an uh, excerpt in Yiddish of Rossini's Barber, and, Barber of Seville. <laughs> Oh, 
Again, that too is in the public domain, so you can enjoy that the rest of it if you're if you're interested. <laughs> so I wanted to move now to the third major way in which opera was embedded in the Yiddish theater, and that was the overlap in content, both musical and dramatic. So we'll start by looking at the musical aspect. Uh, one of the things that intellectuals in the Yiddish uh, circles felt was wrong with historical operettas was their derivative nature in uh, Dramatic content, people like Horvitz and Latina were, were notorious for lifting stories, characters, whole scenes from existing European literary sources and reworking them just a little bit and you know, packaging them in ways that were popular and appealing to Yiddish audiences. Um, and one of the ways in which they they worked was with having their composers like Perlwood and Vol take chunks of uh, existing operas from so the traditional standard popular European operatic repertoire and just plunking them in. Uh, there is an interview that Frumkin did with Joseph Rumshinsky, who was a very successful, prominent uh, conductor and composer of the Yiddish theater in the early years of the 20th century. And he conducted an interview with him talking about the, the four periods of the Yiddish operetta. And from um, Frumkin reports that Rumshinsky described the historical operetta period of works by people like Horvitz and Latiner as the most unfortunate period of Yiddish theater, in part because they recognized that whole parts of European operas, as you can see here from the list, were just imported wholesale, which annoyed the intellectuals who probably knew these operas quite well and recognized it. Most of the rest of the audience probably recognized the operatic style, but probably didn't know the operas well enough to know or care that they were taking these you know, quotations or borrowings, however you want to look at it. Um, in any case, the, the, the music of opera was really worked into uh, the Yiddish theater in, in these ways. And even when in places where it's not actual quotation, just the Italian operatic style is often um, sort of part of the very diverse musical landscape of the Yiddish operettas at the time. I mean, even Goldfaden was drawing on, as you heard in that bit from Sholemus, drawing on um, people like Verdi and the Belcanto composers as well. Just to give you a closer look at what this borrowing looked like, um, I've been doing research, as Mark mentioned, with Ruthia Belovich at the University of Haifa as part of the Dybbuk project. And we've been looking at Horvitz's Ben Chadora, which is a historical operetta from 1901 that was a smash hit, really runaway success that ran for 23 weeks straight, which was unheard of in the Yiddish theater. And it was you know, taken back across um, the Atlantic and performed all over Europe and extremely successful. And there's a grand scene in, in the operetta where there's a big march. And when I first looked at the music, I was really struck by how much this reminded me of Verdi's Il Trovatore. There's absolutely no doubt that Perlmutter and Vol, whether consciously or unconsciously, they were drawing on the anvil chorus. Charlie was probably one of the most, if not the most well-known, uh, the best known parts of the opera. In the introduction to the march, as you can see here in the commercial sheet music, uh, version of this. Um, it draws on the uh, the rhythm, the minor key, the melody, on the intervals of the introduction to the anvil chorus. Um, you can't tell from this, but if you look at the scores, uh, many of which actually survive of Ben Hador, you can see the instrumentation is similar. You have the orchestra in unison, the phrase structure is similar, even that that trill you can see, that sort of grand, um, grand landing moment that also you can hear in the, um, in, in the Verdi. And in this first section of the march, after the introductory bit, you can see the third line, it also recalls the main melody of the anvil chorus. It's just the rhythm is sped up, but the melody is really quite similar. Uh, we also see in this very same march, Parable and Vol drawing on Verdi's La Traviata from uh, um, Alfredo and Violetta's big duet, Undi Felice. You can see the third line where they go, da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. Sounds an awful like da, 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 just from Traviata. And in general, the whole bel canto style, as I mentioned, was pervasive in all, a lot of these um, historical operettas. And there are parts that um, of this march that aren't in the printed sheet music um, that also recall uh, Bellini's Casadiva and the kind of fioriture and the um, elaborate ornamentation that that um, the female protagonist sings, um, that that sort of very florid style has worked into the Yiddish theater music as well. 
So I have here a recording from Warsaw, um, from Ben Hador uh, singing not, well, the march, not, not the march, but uh, the big love duet between the male and female protagonists. Um, and you can hear uh, the Italian operatic style here, as well as I think a part that recalls a lot, the drinking song, the Brindisi from La Traviata as well in the opening part. So let's have a listen. that's striking also about that is the structure of the aria which is very much like the bel canto arias you have the female singer and then the male singer and they sing together and then there's a faster virtuosa kind of cabalata ending where they end in sort of a grand high note literally and metaphorically i also want to thank ruthie uh, for being willing to let me share this research with you in this context So the third way in which opera, uh, continuing the third way in which opera is embedded in the Yiddish theater in content um, is also the dramatic side of things. Um, a lot of it has to do with the fact that both opera and the Yiddish theater were drawing on common literary sources. And there were many of them, as you can see here, that inspired uh, both, uh, both spheres. Uh, we have things like Salome, which in, you know, the, both Oscar Wilde's play and the biblical story inspired Three operas, we have Meyerbeer, Massene, and Strauss, a little bit later than the time period, but still clearly a, a prominent um, topic in these theatrical circles. In the Yiddish theater, we had, there's a, there was a production, there was a translation of Wild Hamlet also appeared in uh, Ambroz Tomas's opera, which was listed as one of the pieces in the Vegas repertoire. And there was uh, the Yiddish translation of the, the play, as well as a more thoroughly adapted version of it. Um, called their Yeshiva Bocher, which is sort of more, um, it made the characters Jewish and changed the context, but kept the same basic story. In fact, there's a little bit of Hamlet's 
uh, plot that gets worked into Ben Hador um, in the, some of the some of the characters there. Of course, there's Faust uh, in Gounod and Gordon, Othello, and uh, Dumas' Lady of the Camellias, and also Aurel Acosta, which is perhaps less known today, but it was um, also the subject for a French, uh, Russian opera that again was listed as one of the pieces in Medvedev's repertoire. And uh, an interesting moment here in the Yiddish theater history, you can see here is adjacent ads for both Medvedev singing in Verdi's Otello, in which it's noted that he's singing in German, and um, also performance going on at the same time of Verdi's Otello, of, sort of, of, <laughs> of Shakespeare's Ver uh, Otello in Yiddish adaptation uh, being given by Adler and Tomaszewski. So um, this is clearly a topic that a uh, subject that people could see as being present in both opera and um, more quote unquote regular Yiddish theater productions. As far as we can tell about you know, what the reception was of Medvedev singing, the reports of his concerts are mostly very, very uh, enthusiastic. The uh, reporter for a Montreal newspaper report on his concerts, they were clearly taken by the emotional intensity of his singing, the very passionate, uh, rendition that he gave of these romances and arias from Russian operas, which weren't particularly well known at the time. So that clearly made a big impression. Tomaszewski and also Boaz Young, they mentioned that although, Tom, although Medvedev drew a lot of Russian speakers and I mean, he clearly drew a lot of Yiddish theater audiences because these managers kept, kept putting him in these starring roles, that his voice was clearly past his prime. I think Young just described him as a broken violin. So his strength was, you know, was passed already, but clearly he had a lot of emotional intensity and his singing was obviously good enough to do the, um, the Yiddish theater productions, which had less, put less uh, demand on, um, on, the vocal, um, on the vocal technique perhaps than some of the longer operas. But then again, Vinvedia was doing so many of these that he was probably kept pretty busy. But in any case, you can see here uh, a retrospective of his career that was published in the Yiddish Shabine in 1910. So, you know, a decade already after he left. Um, this was, the Yiddish Shabine was a newspaper that Tomaszewski started that focused on uh, Yiddish theater and um, musical drama as well. There's a ton of opera coverage in this, in this newspaper. And it's a very flattering, uh, actually, uh, you know, biography of Medvedev. I mean, he's still, he was still alive. He still lived for another 15 years. But it's interesting here that you can see in the headline that um, the, the points that, that the newspaper thought worth highlighting was his fame, the fact that he came from the synagogue and went to the opera stage, so underscoring his Jewish roots and also noting his prestige, you know, and his, um, you know, his bona fides through uh, his connections and admiration from what they call the greatest authorities. I mean, among Tchaikovsky himself, as I mentioned, you know, they were, they became friends. So it's also interesting that, you know, at the end of what was clearly a very illustrious career as one of the best opera singers in Russia that Medvedev um, came full circle, came back to his Jewish roots, um, back to Yiddish speaking environment where he began, um, where he was known as a child as Meryl from Medvedevka, known by his childhood friend, actually Sholem Aleichem, who called him that and devoted a couple of chapters in his autobiography to that. So it was a long way from Meryl from Medvedevka to Mikhail Medvedev, uh, but it's just a funny twist of fate that his last set of performances were back in a Yiddish speaking environment, albeit in America. Thank you. So thank you for a wonderful, yet again, another wonderful presentation, Daniela. Thank you so much. Uh, I know some questions have already come in. So um, let me ask those questions. And if anyone else would like to ask a question, feel free to put it in the chat or feel free to raise your hand and we're happy to recognize you. The first question uh, that came in, um, let me just ask uh, Zachary Baker to, uh, to see if he would like to ask that question. Zachary, would you like to ask that question? Uh, yes, that is um, Geraldine Farrar, the portrait of her. Uh, oh, sorry, that's that's sorry, that's not that's not Zachary. That, that's a question from somebody no, why else. Why don't you ask sorry. that question while we see if Zachary wants to? Oh, okay, okay, sure. Um, the, so I should answer the question that just came in about who was who's the singer in yeah, the opening sure, photo. Please. Okay, yeah, that's Geraldine Farrar, who was uh, 
a famous um, American uh, soprano who had a major career at the Met. And uh, that was, that portrait is from a photo of her that's put on the libretti that were, were published by the Hebrew Publishing Company in 1908 that were presumably, you know, intended to familiarize the Yiddish speaking public with the content of these operas. They had a very grand, uh, ambitious list of things that they said they were going to print opera librettos. As far as I know, the only ones that they did are were Carmen, Traviata, Aida, and Faust. Those are the only ones I found. That doesn't mean they don't, don't the ones don't exist. But um, the fact that those booklets had the photo of that famous opera singer affiliated with them that suggested that kind of glamour and fame or something was something that audiences would Yiddish speaking audiences would have recognized and would have been appealing and would have made them pick up the libretto to read it. And these are really quite detailed libretti, actually, um, you know, the story and also some of the historical background of the operas. Thank you. So, uh, uh, Zachary, we have unmuted you, so you should be able to ask your question. Yeah, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Daniela. Uh, listening to that Figaro aria, I was wondering if you're able to identify the Yiddish translators of these uh, uh, these texts, these opera texts, these classic texts. Yeah, I have not been able to track those down. That one's that Figaro recording seems to be kind of a, a standalone. I don't know who you know, commissioned it or whether it came from a broader uh, production. I know that I have found printed Yiddish translations of Pagliacci and Cavalier Rusticana from Europe, mm -hmm. but I don't know yet how and where they are performed. I have some reason to think that there were some productions of these standard you know, Italian operas in Yiddish in London. Um, there was in fact, uh, there's a composer, a Jewish composer, Samuel Allman, who was active in the London scene, who did, who put on um, his own Yiddish, original Yiddish opera that Vinogradov actually sang in. Um, also a Yiddish version of La Juive was also done. So there was some kind of opera done in Yiddish translation, but I don't, I haven't yet figured out exactly who or when. <laughs> so it's possible that this Figaro was done, but uh, it might've just been a one-off, but it's, it's certainly something to hopefully track down someday. Thank you. Danielle, there's an, uh, another question that someone had asked regarding um, how to get access to these recordings. I know you um, drew from the Mayrant collection. I don't know if there's a way you can uh, share with people how to find Sure, them. I can drop the link from the page I was using in the chat and then you can oh, wonderful. Uh, search. Okay. You know, there's a tremendous repository there of things. It's just wild. <laughs> um, let me, let me put it into the chat. So the Mayron Collection has a wealth of uh, Yiddish recordings of the 78 era. And uh, great. All right, I hope that, that helps those who are interested in locating. And- um, the Library of Congress also has, has some of those as well. Um, Vinograd of the figure recording you can get there as well <laughs> to the Library of Congress um, website. You can search for it there. Great. Um, so maybe while people might be thinking of other questions, let me just pose one to you. Um, I really love the graphic that you provided on the comparison, um, you know, between opera and Yiddish theater in terms of how synagogue music was a part of that, tutorial training was a part of it. Most of the stories that we hear about Yiddish theater composers is that they felt as if Yiddish theater was just kind of like you know, their day job and they were really kind of aiming higher and wanted to write opera or write something somewhere else. Is that model or narrative also correct for the singers? Because you're, because you, you, you kind of present it in a, in a more of a interconnected way, which is very interesting rather than the hierarchical way. Yeah, from what I can tell, there were some performers like Regina Praga, for example, who might have gone in an operatic direction, but I ended up staying in the Yiddish theater because there was interest, it was right there. I mean, you probably had to trade, I mean, I'm sure you had to pay for training in conservatories and not everybody had the means to do that. And I don't know how easy it was to get scholarships. So it's possible that it was um, sort of a second tier thing, but for people like Yuvalier, I don't think, you know, it's pretty clear he had some kind of 
training, you know, probably Ken Toro, I don't have any reason to think he had operatic training. Um, but he, a lot of these performers had, you know, extremely successful careers in the industry. I don't have any sense that he was you know, desperate to get into um, the opera world. I mean, it brings with it its own pitfalls and own, its own challenges. Um, I think there was some sense of the hierarchy as far as the quality expected of singing. That is when people like Medvedev and Melanie Guzman were brought over and promoted as people from the Vienna Opera, from the Russian Opera. There was some expectation that they were going to be more trained, uh, more, um, you know, uh, more you know, refined, for lack of a better word, uh, singers who had you know, more control over their voice, perhaps, or, or bigger voices than those in the Yiddish theater. But my sense is that the stars of the Yiddish theater, people like Regina Prager and Bertha Kalish, and Tomaszewski too, that they had really very powerful and uh, appealing voices that audiences were perfectly happy to hear. So while there was a hierarchy, as I said, of you know the, the opera singers, uh, I don't have a sense that that there was a you know a sense of uh, you know restriction or or dissatisfaction. You know, these sort of second-rate singers being stuck in the Yiddish theater, and that they really wanted to do was to sing Carmen. Um, so that's my sense. I, I could be wrong, but that's what I've encountered so far. So it sounds like it's a lot more fluid for these performers. Uh, yeah. These two arenas. And for composers too. I mean, someone like Hermann Voll, even as he was working with Pearl Mutter in the Yiddish theater and churning out these operas. I mean, that's one of the reasons perhaps that you're, you're pointing to is by, you know, composers who aspire, aspire to something you know, more serious, you know, one of the things about working in the Yiddish theater was the incredible speed at which everybody had to work because it was so competitive. Everyone had to turn these things out really, really quickly. And if it was a flop, you'd you're on to the next thing. So there was a lot of pressure to keep, keep doing new things. And of course, if you're doing things so quickly, you're going to have to rely on formulas and quick ways of getting a good melody. So you can draw on Verdi now and then, you know, not a bad source. But, but I was going to someone like Vol, even he, even as he was, you know, busy in the Yiddish theater, he maintained a parallel career writing liturgical music as well. Um, and actually, I think, moved back into that more exclusively uh, later in life. So there's a, a real synergy between those, those two spheres. And there's, of course, much music of the Yiddish theater sounds um, quite liturgical, very cantorial, draws on um, prayers uh, of the synagogue, very recognizable bits. Actually, there's a part in Ben Hador, again, this is research from what I've been doing with Ruthie, uh, where the, there's a, the, the rain prayer that the chorus sings in Ben Hador that draws very, very explicitly on the melody from one of the High Holy Days, uh, Nusach from the Neila. So it's very recognizable. It actually comes up in a Goldfaden, um, Goldfaden aria as well. So um, it's all, all part of this very intricate web of musical influences of the Yiddish theater. There's a lot of, of, of Wall's um, liturgical pieces that are still sung today. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're a little rearranged, but but he's still kind of a real sought after, you know, the, the, the sound that he created in, in um, uh, synagogue music that maybe had a theatrical sound is something that's, that still has a life today. Um, you know, it, it's so interesting that there's this, um, you know, crossover that to like, the attraction to Yiddish theater is that this person is an opera singer and maybe also a cantor where just to juxtapose it with today, the one type of voice people don't want is an opera singer. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So it's just so interesting that, that, um, that the movement that people had and the aesthetic they desired was really, um, you know, that, you know, I guess in a way deeply integrated. Yeah, and I think that has a lot to do with the fact that the performance style of the highbrow and popular spheres really into the mid 20th century in America, at least, was a much more similar aesthetic than it is today. So if you listen to recordings of operettas or you know, musical comedies, um, things that we have from the early 20th century, the singing is very operatic. Even some of the early musicals, you, know, you hear people singing that's from, you know, things from the 1920s. And the, the singing style is still extremely operatic because there, there's no electronic amplification. They're projecting to a big house. So you have to sing that way in order to be heard. Once you start getting popular music that's recorded into a microphone, you don't have to belt your sound anymore. Even in Broadway musicals today, I mean, people are amplified. So it cultivates a different kind of performance style. And I think that's contributed to the bifurcation of the singing style of the popular sphere and the highbrow sphere that, that you're pointing to. OK, 
Okay, uh, maybe in the closing couple of minutes, do you want to just give us a preview for uh, what we'll hear from you in our next fourth session? Sure. So I'll be talking about the Zero Opera Company, which is kind of a blast from the past in some ways. They're a little bit later. They uh, Josiah Zero and his father, they were putting on opera in um, in Italian on the Lower East Side between about 1911 and 1915. That was already a little bit past the heyday of, of the earlier popular price opera scene that I was talking about earlier. And look at the ways in which they drew on these cultural connections within the Yiddish speaking circles to, to bring people to these popular price performances, but also how they found ways of appealing to broader audiences, even as they you know, advertised in Yiddish papers and still catered very much to, um, to Yiddish speakers as well. I mean, they, they even had a the daughter of one of the major political and social figures of the Lower East Side. They had her singing in some of the performances. So that was advertised in the papers and drew a lot of people to that. But Zuro actually had a, had a quite a long career as a real educator. So he's kind of a link between this older style of popular price opera that's quote unquote uplifting in some ways. And it's viewed as kind of high culture and also a, a more a moving into a more mainstream a cultural sphere. And that'll be the next one. And then the final lecture, we kind of a more holistic um, view of how it all fits together and looking at where all these operatic and Yiddish connections fit within uh, the broader cultural sphere of the time and thinking about how these um, operatic interests mesh with, you know, broader cultural, social, political developments of the time. So thank you for bringing us into the arena of the performers after having uh, shared with us aspects, I guess, of the empresarios. And uh, then we look forward to the, uh, the fourth and fifth topic moving ahead. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And thank you all for